Welcome to this week's Mental Health Mastery. And today we are once again talking to Dan Calco about objectification theory. And it sounds technical, but it actually was a really great conversation where we talked about objectification, both men and women and the mental health effects behind it and some of the reasons for it, as well as some things that we can do. So before we begin, please make sure to like, comment, subscribe, maybe even share with a friend. It all really helps our channel reach those who might need it. And don't forget about our podcast, Mental Health Mavens, which you can find anywhere that you get your favorite podcasts. So with that, welcome Dan. Well, why don't you give us an introduction? We'll start off with an introduction of it. Sure. So objectification theory is a framework that a lot of people use to help understand from a feminist perspective, what women go through in terms of being objectified in today's society. And it's a, a helpful framework because for a lot of people, women included, they don't understand how someone can be object- objectified and what are some of the psychological and social factors that play into objectification. Yeah, we just did a post, we collaborated with the FAB program on it and how it affects eating disorders in women. Well, and in men too. Yeah, yeah for sure. And and objectification in general, uh, just maybe outside a little bit from the whole feminist perspective is when somebody treats some thing like a, a person or an animal as a thing. And we can see how that would be problematic in terms of how we relate to these other beings, I guess. And this is where we see things like animal abuse or um, other types of violence against people in terms of ethnic violence or racial violence, because when we're no longer fellow humans or fellow living beings, it's very easy to separate the morality away from what we do to these things. And so it's very easy to treat a person or an animal as a thing and not feel bad about it because we've changed them from a human or an animal to a thing. And I don't really care that much if I break my chair or that thing, other than it's going to cost me money to replace because I don't have that same attachment to it as I would to like my dog of 12 years or my kids or my wife that I've been with develop those intimate, emotionally based relationships with. We generally don't have that with the, with objects writ large. Okay. So in terms of objectifying women, Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've heard a lot of us women talking about it. What Mm -hmm. happens? What's the psychology behind that then? It's it's kind of complicated in terms of how it happens. But our the way that our society has developed over the last, I would say, 150, 200 years where we've diminished the value of women in terms of what they input into our collective society. So we often hear about devaluation of women's work in terms of Uh, the work they do in raising children or have traditionally done in raising children or some of the jobs even that women do in the workforce tend to be looked down upon. And so that's kind of one of the pieces in how we start to devalue women. And if we devalue the work, then the person doing the work, it's very easy to, to trace that logic back to be like, if this work isn't that important, then the person doing that work isn't important And if that person isn't very important, then I don't have to connect with that person in the same way that I would, let's say, a fellow man in terms of doing an important job. Well, and it's probably a family of origin type thing as well, too, I would imagine. It it can be, yeah. So the way that we reinforce it through society in terms of how we objectify women, not only their work, but their person, right? When we when we boil down a woman to their to certain attributes, right, like their looks or um, their sexuality, or the the different characteristics that make up a whole person, if we start looking at only small parts of those, and then treat the person by that part, like, I'm sure we've heard a lot of derogatory terms, and I'm sure you've heard them as well, in terms of, oh, look at that ass, or look at those legs, or, or those kind of things, or now we're no longer referring to the person as a person, we're specifically focusing on a part of the person, which again, in our mind, separates that from a person, now it's just a body part or a certain characteristic that we now no longer have to create the same empathy and compassion to. I do. Uh, in, in working with a lot of young girls, I talk a lot to them about, I mean, TikTok, we see it on TikTok girls and, and, and not to say that we bring it upon ourselves, but, but demanding that respect to be seen as a, as a woman, as a human, as who we are and not the object that we're portraying. 
And that's a big part of it too, is it, it all depends on who is doing the objectifying. And in our society, when we look at it, the power dynamic tends to be skewed amongst the sexes. So men tend to have more power, especially in Western society, or what we like to call Western society. It gets skewed down. So there's less power for women. And then this even gets subdivided into women, white women, women of color, and then trans people. So trans people tend to be the least powerful in our society. And then there's women of color and then there's white women and there's white men and there's, it's all stratified, but that's just kind of generally how the power distribution goes. And so when we look at who is doing the objectifying, now we bring into it social power dynamics. And when we have the gaze, oftentimes in literature, in the objectification theory, literature, they talk about objectifying gaze. And that's when the best word that I can come up with is when men leer at women. I think that's kind of the best word that I've come to be able to describe how that look is. Um, and that is devaluing in terms of they're no longer looking at equals. They're looking down in terms of being able to understand the value and, and, the, and the intrinsic value, not in terms of a person as a whole person and what they bring to better society, but the commodification maybe or the the value of those parts and how it brings and so that's one of those parts that's really difficult for a lot of people to understand but it does take two now saying that that can be internalized for women as well and as you mentioned tiktok now we find out the things that gain and garner attention and when let's say young women or girls or beautiful women or fit women or whatever you want to look or however you want to call it, when they see that that leering or that attention brings them a small increase in power, now it gets reinforced. So subconsciously it gets reinforced where now they're basing their status. And again, I'm speaking broadly, but but a lot of women will base their status on, look, I went from 100,000 likes to a million likes because I showed more whatever body part. Now I've internalized that as a way to get attention and therefore now I have power and I'm going to reinforce that. And now everybody else seeing that, all the young women and girls who look up to these TikTokers or these Instagram models now see that they're living the fancy life or they're well off or they're gaining financial power or freedom. They now try to emulate that. And so it becomes this vicious cycle of external objectification becoming internalized. And that has profound effects on or women of all ages, their mental man, mental health. Yeah. Well, and then there's the flip side of it. The women who have had a lot of trauma and then we get leered at and it can have the opposite effects where it can be absolutely devastating for us because it's a loss of power for a woman to be leered at who's had a lot of trauma. Exactly. In that case, we're triggering the trauma. So we're subconsciously triggering the trauma because whatever that trauma was, Usually it involves in a, a very strong powerless feeling, whether it's something as maybe innocuous as a car accident or something as, as, as violent as a sexual assault. In those situations, the person experiencing the victim is powerless, where there's a lot of powerless feelings in those. And in this way, the subconscious is, is identifying that lack of power and it's bringing up that trauma. So it can be re-traumatizing every time somebody experiences that. And in this society, we kind of, we, I say we women tend to have that happen to them fairly often. Well, I know part of our goals with Nomina is, you know, to spread awareness and mental health. So I know that I can speak for a lot of women that are on TikTok doing this and that's don't, <laughs> you know, but I want to hear what you would say to men who are doing, cause we've all as women have experienced that where we're talking to a guy and he's not looking at us in the eyes, he's looking somewhere else and, and objectifying us. And, and then the, the cat calling and the, and the, the, the things that they say to us. And so what would your advice be to men? I think that's really difficult because it varies. Like you said, in terms of family of origin, culture, the historical stuff that happens in that country, religion, we all have our own components that build into how we either support or don't support objectifying women. And so that's a hard question to answer writ large, but one of my kind of broad pieces of advice would be, how do you talk to your mother, for example, right? Do we objectify our, our parents, our mother, or mothers, or grandmothers, right? These are strong relationships that we have probably some of the strongest relationships we have in our lives. And we tend not to objectify our mothers, especially as men, and I can't speak for all men, but um, Oedipus aside, 
we don't objectify our mothers in the way or grandmothers or those familiar relations or sisters maybe in that same way. And so finding a healthy relationship that we have with a woman that isn't in a sexualized way is a very helpful kind of frame of reference to be like, well, I can talk to my sister, my older sister in a way that we're equals or we're more, much more like people. We've taken away that sexuality piece because in this society, there's a lot of emphasis placed on that sexuality, right? We know from advertising that sex sells and it has for a hundred years or more. And so we know that those are the things that get our limbic system going. We know that that's how we are programmed. Advertisers use that to their advantage to sell us stuff we don't need and sometimes stuff we do need, but it has a side effect of objectifying women. And if you look at the ads from the forties and the fifties, and those are all so sexually charged that they would never be allowed today. But those are the things that inform our society and our history, right? Our parents, especially my generation, were born in the 50s and the 60s. And then all through the 80s, even if we look at the music videos to today and Instagram and TikTok, it's all about sexuality, being sexually attractive, sexually wanted. But again, that becomes objectifying because that's only a small part of what a human brings to any relationship is a sexual aspect. And so to the men that are looking at this, we have to deconstruct what is causing this. What is our history, right? Where did our parents come from? What did they teach us? What are our healthy relationships look like with the, the women that we respect in our lives as equals? And then what components from that can we take and transfer into the, the relationships that we have or want to have with the women in our lives in, in terms of how do we treat them as equals? Because if we start talking to them as our equals, then it's a lot harder to objectify them because now we're seeing them as a whole, as an intellect, as a cognitive piece, as an emotional piece, as a physical piece, as all the skills-based pieces that reinforce all of those things. Those are those components that we want to identify. That's a lot of work. It's a lot easier to look at a pretty girl and say, wow, she's really attractive. And then that's it. That That's the level at where our kind of mental gymnastics stops. But that's a very easy road to objectifying people, and in this case, women. I know from my dating days, when I was dating, one of my red flags was if I met a guy who didn't have any female friends, and when I would say, well, how come you don't have any female friends? And they would answer, well, because if they're a friend and they're female, I might as well be sleeping with them. That was an immediate yeah. red flag that if they could not, if they were not capable of having a female as a friend without wanting to have sexual relations with them, mm -hmm. then no fly. Yeah. yeah. And that's one of the things that it becomes an exchange, right? So some of these men will view women as a means to their own sexual gratification. So they become a sexual object for their own pleasure. And in terms of the disparity in terms of sexual pleasure in our society, we see that women, more men orgasm during sexual intercourse than women do. And it's like four to one. I don't know the statistics offhand, but it's like 20% to 85% or something women and men achieve orgasm during sexual intercourse. And we can see that this is where that becomes skewed is that we've prioritized men's sexual gratification over women because women are designed and have been put upon them the job of satisfying or gratifying their men sexually. And we can see that playing out. And this is even between healthy couples. We see that female sexual pleasure is, is not often prioritized or sometimes not prioritized. Again, I'm, I'm speaking broadly here because there are a lot of healthy relationships and couples where those statistics are much more balanced, but it is one of those things where we see that. I could have never survived in the fifties. <laughs> It was definitely a hard time. Yeah, it was a hard time for, for women and, and people in general where the, the gender dynamic and the pandemic was so skewed. But we also look at those, um, those times with our own kind of filter, our own lens, because we didn't live those times. And if we think about it, there are a lot of strong women during those times. And a lot of the couples that I talked to have strong relationships where they had balance, they had gender balance in their home. A lot of women worked, right? For example, in my family, both my parents worked. Uh, in my, my parents' families, both their parents worked, right? So now we're going into the 20s and the 30s. Like my grandmother was a crane operator in Eastern Europe, right? It was, it's not very, it's not a traditional, we wouldn't see that as a traditional female job. Like one of those, like she moved rail cars from rails to, like the, the depot, like this is a very masculine type job in our society. And I think this is part of that 
understanding where now we think that this is the way that it always was, it helps reinforce a lot of our understanding that it's always been like this. And therefore, we have that naturalistic fallacy where it says, well, women were always the homemakers and men were always the warriors and the workers. And why should we go against it? Again, that becomes a very simplistic way to deflect having to look at somebody as a complex human being and say, no, the Vikings had warriors. No, the Egyptian has warriors. There's lots of warrior, female warriors throughout history. We just don't tend to focus on them. There's a lot of hardworking women that we tend not to focus on. A lot of our historical uh, understandings of the last, I would say, 60 to 80 years. Uh, but again, it gets skewed by popular culture. When we, like I said before, when we look at those ads from the 60s and the 50s, where it's super sexualized, or the TV shows, or even TV, TV shows today, like Mad Men, that try to portray a time back then, they do it through our lens. And it's not, not always the case. Yeah, very true. Well, I know that my own son, I have tried to raise him up to have complete respect for women and not objectify them. And I know you as well are a feminist. So I think we've come a very long way. And I think that's one of the positives that we can see that we're able to have strong men be supporters of women. And that's one of the things that is really hard for men to do is to stand up for women on behalf of women, because that may mean a diminishment of our power in that social circle. Because a lot of social circles are still very skewed in terms of gender dynamics. A lot of workplaces are skewed in gender dynamics. If we take a look at predominantly male-dominated jobs like the military, police, firefighters, it is very skewed still in terms of those jobs. And having um, confident men be able to stand up and say, no, women can do the same jobs as men can do because we're we use the word equal, we're equitable in terms of what we bring to the to the table. We can all do the same jobs. And that's hard to do because you, you, you stick your neck out and it exposes you to a lot of potential backlash. And so having courage for the men that want to support women, I would say have the courage and stand up for that because internally, deep down, you know that's what's right. We know that's what's right. And even just being able to listen and talk to women who have had these experiences and understand their perspective and actually listen can be very helpful at bridging that gap between not ob between objectifying someone and not objectifying someone because now we have to go through their lived experience and then we have to relate emotionally to the catcalling and the leering and the passing over for promotions and all of those things because those things in us would be would be very difficult emotionally i can tell you that if men were pa passed over because of their looks for a promotion or for a job, they'd be very upset. And those same emotions come to come to play with women all the time. They've just learned to internalize them, not complain about them. When they do complain about them, they're further belittled for complaining and, and bitching and all sorts of other derogatory terms that we have because they're not allowed to. They're supposed to take their licks and just keep going because they're not really people. And that's that hard part. Yeah, no, I know in my profession, men are still paid far more than I am as a woman in, in my profession. And that's, it's not fair. It, it is not fair. And again, that's where if you're in charge of hiring as a man, or you're on a board or an HR team, and you start looking at that, taking away the gender piece is very, very important, right? A lot of companies will get rid of names and genders on their um, resumes or on their hiring packages in order to just try to compare skills and experience levels. That's one of the ways that you can try to change or de-institutionalize the system because it's women tend to, have, tend to have feminine names and men tend to have masculine names. And again, like I said, generalization, but it's one of those things where now all of a sudden, even if you're not consciously looking at it, that subconscious building of all of your culture, relation, experience, experiences, social media, all of that is still sitting there in that subconscious background, influencing your decision. And so treating people at least at the initial stages, maybe with letters or numbers, can be helpful at comparing apples to apples instead of men to women, because we're actually comparing people to people, we can take that away from us. It's not perfect, but it, there are ways that you can do it. No, that's a great idea. Yeah. Okay. Anything else that you wanted to cover that we didn't get to? I'd like to share a personal anecdote about some of my personal experiences with this. And so you're aware that you and I manage kind of nominas social media together. And one of those pieces is managing the Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn accounts for the directors of the company. 
And uh, we, uh, we like to, we're proud of the fact that, so we're proud of the fact that we're a female run company, right? We're predominantly, our owners are predominantly female. Most of our employees tend to be female. And so that means that I manage female LinkedIn accounts at times with you. And recently there was a solicitation for a business agreement that came in from a man and we won't talk about the details of it, but he said that he wanted to, he was asking if we needed to get in touch with bankers or financing or funding to see if they could help us make our product better or what standard kind of opening advertising line. And so managing this account on one of the director's behalf, I said, no, thank you. We're not looking at entering into any kind of financial arrangements this time. Have a nice day. To which this man responded, very objectifying. You have a pretty smile. You look so good. There's a lot of sexy qualities to you. Can I have your personal phone number or email so we can get together and have dinner? And I know that for you and for a lot of women, that's kind of par for the course. That's kind of standard in terms of the business professional interaction that you have with men. And not all men, I'm sure, but it happens probably fairly or semi-regularly. In this case, this was my first experience with that blatant, over-the-top, highly charged language in terms of objectifying a woman based off of her appearance. And I took this personally because I was the one managing this account, and I got very upset about this. And it wasn't even me that they were objectifying. So I can totally understand how upsetting it can be for a woman, and to have it done all the time is so difficult. And and we won't talk about how I responded to that because it it was it was a lot of work for me to work through my own power and privilege to be able to understand why this is happening to me. And that was literally the first time I ever felt objectified as a man, even though I wasn't being objectified, I was being objectified on behalf of a woman. So it's a little complicated, but it's still one of those things that I wanted to share in terms of I felt all of those emotions that maybe women feel on a regular basis or have learned to even dismiss. You do. You learn to dismiss it. I remember at one position that I had earlier in my career, it, I was, it was heavily suggested that I wear a skirt. Mm. And especially when I was out trying to get funds and do things like that, that yeah, wear a skirt, look cute. Yeah. That's what was going to bring in the money. And, and that's unfortunate. And unfortunate. And what's even more unfortunate is that had you done that, you probably would have been more successful. And that's that unfortunate part that I mentioned earlier, where it reinforces. So the subjectifying behavior becomes internalized, then it gets reinforced. So you get a positive reward mechanism out of it, which then encourages you to do it more, which then creates this vicious loop. And now you become this successful person that other women look up to and they go, how did Joanne make it up there? Oh, I know she wore a mini skirt. And then they do that. And, that. and that's not your goal, but it's the way that it ends up happening. And one of the things that we haven't really discussed is that anxiety, that social pressure that comes along with a lot of this in terms of not being able to meet these standards. And what we know is that with Instagram, we have filters galore that make us look younger and our skin tone nicer and our lips better and our eyes slightly bigger and it smooths out our wrinkles and our hair looks amazing. And even the sky behind us looks that little bit better blue that helps trigger our, our subconscious to have us like these things. And most Instagram accounts, the ones that are popular anyway, are fraught with filters and they look very good. But now we have this this difficult expectation that we cannot meet. So when we look in the mirror, our mirror doesn't have that filter. Our mirror just reflects us. And so when we look in the mirror and compare it to next to our phones and our skin tone is off or we've got pimples or freckles or wrinkles and we see this Instagram model that doesn't have these things, we internalize that difference. Now we've got shame because we can't meet, there's an expectation we can't meet. So we're, we're looking to want to be here. This is where that successful woman is or that successful person. Objectification works for men too. Look at any, any uh, famous Hollywood actor. They're always ripped with a six pack, right? But there's an objective, there's an ideal, there's us, and we can't meet that difference. So we feel bad about ourselves. And we not so much we feel bad about ourselves. We feel like we're a bad person because we can't meet what that person is because they're they're rich and they're famous and they're beautiful and that must make them a good person. And then we aren't those things. So we must not be a good person. That's where that shame, that, that damaging shame comes in. We internalize that shame. 
that generates anxiety. That anxiety is a precursor to mental health issues, which can lead to things like social anxiety, can lead to body dysmorphic, dysmorphic, dysmorphia, sorry, body dysmorphia, and other mental health issues, all because we have these unrealistic expectations about our culture that creates objectification, that reinforces objectification, which we internalize, which makes us feel worse. And that cycle just becomes more and more and more vicious. And it's unfortunately on the shoulders of women that tend to have to bear this more often. My um, motto to other women is just grace and dignity. That's just, just have the grace to be who you are and the dignity in how you act and grace and dignity. I think it becomes a little bit more like it's one of those problems that we can't solve on our own. Like we can do what we can for our own mental health. And I think that's really important. We've got to continue to improve our, our own self-compassion and we got to do all those things that make us feel good about who we are. But I think in terms of how we do deal with this as a society, we have to see this as a damaging belief, a damaging act. And so we look at, let's say smoking and we have, these horrific pictures. If I don't know if you've looked at a cigarette pack lately, but there it's like a horror film basically, or a scene from a horror film on this carton of cigarettes. And that's because we've learned that smoking is bad for us, right? If, if you smoke, you will have detrimental health effects. They will be one of however many dozens of health effects, the worst of which is cancer and death. So we've taken to providing a big warning label that says, do not smoke. If you smoke, you risk these horrible effects. But we don't do the same in terms of objectifying women. You go to the supermarket and those magazines with those Photoshop women, and they've been Photoshopped for decades, sit at kid eye level. I don't know if you've noticed. They sit at eye level to kids and women. Men tend to stand above them. I don't know if you've noticed. So the average height of a woman is like 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five, and the man's like 5'10". And if you take a look at, next time you're at a grocery store, take a look at what magazines are placed at different height levels and see where these things are being targeted. And that's one of the things that uh, when we start looking, when we look at early objectification theory literature is their recommendation was to put warning labels on these things, to hide these things. Or you can't even go into a store and see cigarettes anymore because the act of seeing them triggers that addictive behavior that makes you want them. And so now you go into Canadian, uh, most Canadian um, provincial um, stores that sell cigarettes, they're behind opaque doors. And you have to ask specifically for the brand that you want. Uh, or else they won't give it to you. You can't browse shop like you can with clothes or vegetables or whatever. You want to pick the one that, that attracts you the most. And that, I think, one of the things that we need to start looking at is how do we do that in terms of what content our young people are consuming in terms of that social or that objectification standard, that I idealistic and unrealistic beauty standard. So... It was something that uh, Barbara Fredrickson, when she first started to write about objectif objectification theory, suggested in her kind of paper was, what happens if we cover those things up? What happens if we provide warning labels to these things that say, the content herein does not represent natural beauty standards or realistic beauty standards and is only meant as, I don't know, reference or art or whatever you want to call it, but it, it has something that causes us to think twice about purchasing these and consuming them, let alone consuming them, not even by choice. You go outside and you see billboards, 40 foot billboards of, of, of women with whatever selling jewelry or Rolexes or fragrances or clothing or cars or whatever. These things are they're everywhere and perhaps they shouldn't be. Yeah. Yeah, maybe Instagram needs to do that. When you click that filter, it gives you a quick little pop-up that says, hey, did you know? It, it could be one of those things. And maybe there would have to, or, or something where it shows both pictures. It shows the unedited picture and the edited picture for you to be able to see what realistic beauty standards look like. I, I don't know. I don't have all the solutions, but I do know that the mental health of young women, especially young women, adolescent and teenage girls is way worse in terms of self-esteem or self-compassion than it is even for young boys. Both young boys and young girls lose a bit of self-esteem once they enter their teenage years, but for young girls, it's drastically more. Well, at least we're talking about it. And that starts always begins with the conversation. 100%.
and I encourage everyone to. I'm happy to talk about it. It's one of the passions of mine. I'm trying to raise a feminist son uh, and strong women and strong girls uh, in our family as well. So. Yeah, yep. and you do. Your wife is absolutely lovely. I, <laughs> she's a role model for me. <laughs> Perfect. And me as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dan. And once, as always, we'll leave your contact information in the description and sure. the show notes for the podcast. So thank you very much. Thank you. Come on.